Everybody, welcome to Popular Culture. Let's talk about myth today. All right, so I apologize in advance. No, oh, do I? I don't know. I might cut that. I know this is going to be difficult, and I know we've dealt with difficult texts already, so this must be crazy, right? It is difficult, but it's also actually, once you break it down and work with it, relatively simple. But it's challenging at the beginning, so I kind of apologize for that, but it's good for you, promise you. This is actually one of the most important things I learned in grad school uh, to really look into this, and I think you will benefit greatly if you think about what Roland Barthes is expressing today. So let's start with an earlier time, one of the first real historical linguists as we know them today or as we might consider them today was a man named Ferdinand de Saussure. That name, if you study communication, if you study uh, semiotics, really important. Everyone should know him. And he didn't do anything crazy by today's standards, but he just came up with a very simple idea that nobody had really expressed and articulated well before. Uh, and that is basically the idea of signs. So signs, yes, they existed for a long time before him. But what he realized when he was asked to sort of teach this class on the history of languages, rather than do what most people did, which was basically say, here is old English and it comes from Germanic roots and it borrows on this. And so we went from this word to this word and that's why we spell it this way. Rather than look at the specifics of particular languages, he asked himself, how does language in general work? And how has language evolved? Which is pretty heady stuff, but it's also, we're gonna deal with a little tiny chunk of that. And that's, so signification. So signs, signification, right? It's all about expressing something. And what he said, basically, is that there is a signifier, which let's use me for example. So the signifier is, Chris, right? You can use that, and as long as you have the context correct, you know, I know there are, I'm not the only guy named Chris, but especially if you said Chris Richardson, you know that you're talking about me. And so I, this guy right here, this idea of this guy right here is the signified. I'm the signified. And so the signifier is the text or the sounds that you make when you speak, and the signified is the thing that you're talking about. So you could do the same for tree, right? The signifier in English, T-R-E-E, -E. I could say it, tree, or I could write it, T-R-E-E, -E. and that means, that idea that pops into your head of a tree outside maybe, that's, uh, that's what the signified is. And so, it's not super difficult, I hope, to understand that part, but it's important because a lot of the time before him, people thought that language was a reflection of reality, right? So like, that's a tree, or that's an arb, or that's, I don't know any other languages. So um, that's the thing. And me saying it is just reflecting what's over there, that thing outside, right? Like, I am Chris. What he noticed, though, is that tree, T-R-E-E, -E, in English at least, doesn't really mean anything. Like, there are just, these are just sounds that we've decided to put together, and the only reason it means something is because it's different than three. So three is spelled with an H, tree is not. But otherwise, it's just different sounds that we make. So, again, it might not seem super important, but it is because there's no natural reason that one, two, three you do it like that or you say it like that and that over there outside is a tree and that this guy here is Chris. There's no um, rhyme or reason to it. It's just that we've decided based on convention that in English at least, that's what we'll use to describe things. And that has implications for how we communicate, right? It, the, the main one is that we have to start thinking about words and language not as inherent things, right? Like that just is a uh, blank. Instead, we have to think about it as a social convention that society has decided to call that thing a blank, right? My parents decided to call me Chris. People before them decided that Chris was a name, right? Obviously, it comes from Christianity, even though you may not have roots in Christianity, you're oneself, the, the name Chris exists, and my parents chose it. It's actually Christopher, but I hate being called that. Now all the students that don't like me will call me Christopher behind my back, and that's fine. 
Um, but yeah, so even that, right, it can change. Like I could choose to go by Christopher or I could choose by, by going by Chris. I could choose to be Dr. Richardson all the time, but I really don't like that because it sounds stuffy. And so either way, we are choosing the language. And the only difference between uh, me and somebody else is the differences in the way that we make sounds or the way that we write markings, right? There's no inherent difference that makes me Chris or that makes the thing out there a tree. And so that's language. Plain and simple, I mean, it's maybe not plain and simple, but it, that's the basic language. Now the, the slightly more difficult part, right? So you have a sign, and that sign is made out of a signifier and a signified. Roland Bar comes along later, and he's a French cultural theorist, philosopher, um, literary scholar, and he basically adds a second one, a second level. And he says that this second level, which he calls myth, allows us to say things without having to say them. Which might sound strange, but you'll realize you do this all the time, you just don't notice it, or you don't understand exactly how it works through the same words, perhaps. But you're doing this, I'm doing this, we're all doing this, right? First, myth, right? Myth is a little bit different than the ancient Greek myths or Roman myths and stuff like that, right? We're not talking about Hercules here. Although we can say how societies come up with ideas that they share with one another, and that's where the myth part is connected to those ideas. But yeah, not Greek mythology or, or superhero mythology, right? Myth, according to Roland Barthes, is just that second order of meaning. And the second order of meaning is a second signifier and a second signified. Just watch this video again, I promise you, it'll make sense eventually. It takes a few days kind of to sink in. Maybe it takes more than one reading of myth today. But eventually you'll realize like, holy shit, my world makes sense now. At least that's how I felt when I realized that, yeah, whenever people say these things, they're also saying these other things. They just don't admit to it. And uh, you'll realize that this happens all the time. Right. And so you, you kind of know this anyway. But so think about again, I'll use myself. Right. So you say C-H-R-I-S. You understand that the context is this guy. And so that signifier signifies me. I'm the signified duh. But then there's a second signifier, which is th that whole sign. So the whole thing put together. And it signifies a mythology, right? So maybe if you've heard of me as a professor, maybe if people think I'm really hard or I'm really difficult to understand or I make amazing videos that you can watch in the privacy of your own home whenever you want to understand a subject better, right? There are all these different ways that you can think about me in this case. And that relates to mythology, right? So if You've maybe heard expressions like that, right? Like the mythology of that professor is that he's super uh, interesting or super difficult or super mean or whatever the case. And that's a mythology that gets established because you associate those things with him, let's say, but you don't say it. So if I said, oh, I'm going to go see Chris Richardson, literally on a linguistic level, right? Think of Fernando Saussure. You're just saying like, I am going to go see that person. But on another level, maybe you mean, I'm really happy, we're going to have a great talk, or I'm really sad, I have to see this person. And you know that when people are expressing that, even though they don't necessarily say anything, right? Sometimes you can get that in a tone of voice or maybe expressions that they use to describe one person as opposed to another. But that secondary meaning, that's myth. And so think of a few things like this, like, like think about this tree, for example, right? You probably have this is a tree, and it's true. If I pointed to that and I said that tree, you'd understand linguistically if you speak English. But you also associate certain things, right? Maybe it makes you happy to think of this kind of tree. Maybe it makes you sad to think of this. Maybe you definitely associate things with it, right? And you associate it because of maybe your family, your religion, your uh, past experiences. The tree has one level of meaning, which is it's, this is a tree. But it has another level of meaning, which is, in this case, this is a Christmas tree, right? Maybe this is a vacation tree for you, like it represents the beach or the holidays. Uh, maybe this is a, a nice natural setting that makes you relaxed, right? That's why a lot of companies, especially ones that pollute, will use images like this because they know that they're not saying that they're clean, but by having a nice green tree in their advertising campaign, for example, they're indicating that they uh, are clean, like natural, and, and so they're not lying. And that's the alibi that they, they can always say, like, if you say, I bought your product because you had these nice green trees on it and I thought you were good for the environment, but you're actually horrible for the environment. 
if you ever really did have a conversation like that with the CEO, the CEO could easily be like, I never said we were, we we're good for the environment. In fact, if you read the little warning, it says we're bad for the environment. You associated the nice tree and the nice green packaging with clean for the environment. That's your fault. I never said anything. And it's true, right? But it's also not true because on a second level, the CEO or the company, they are indicating that they are nice and, and good for the environment simply by using that association. So two words that are important to understand then, other than language and myth, which are like level one, level two, there's denotation. So denotation, denotation is the actual meaning of something, right? So if I said, I'm going to go see Chris Richardson, the denotation is this guy here, that's who you're going to go see. Then there's connotation. Connotation relates to the ideas, the values, the uh, experiences that you might associate with that person or thing or whatever it is you're talking about, right? So if someone's like, oh, I gotta see Chris Richardson, then maybe you understand like, oh, that stuffy professor who goes on and on about these French philosophers, right? Or maybe someone's like, yeah, I get to see Chris Richardson. And like, oh, cool, He's, what are you gonna talk about? It must be interesting, right? They're not necessarily true or false, the second part. Like you can say, I went to see Chris and it's either true or false, right? You saw that guy or you didn't see that guy. On a linguistic level, true or false in, in a lot of cases. On a connotation level, somebody could be happy about seeing me or someone could be sad about seeing me. They're both equally valid. It depends on the connotations that I would have in this case, the mythology about me that would be understood by whoever's talking, right? So if you try to cultivate like a fun, free-spirited person, if somebody says, oh, I'm going to go see Jill, then hopefully if you do it right, then people are associating the mythology of Jill, the actual person, with Jill, the fun, free-spirited person, right? If, uh, if you aren't successful and people are like, oh, fuck, I got to go see Jill, then I'm just making this up. I don't know any Jill, and I'm pretty sure there's no Jill in the class, by the way. But anyway then the mythology of Jill is different. And some people might be happy about seeing Jill and some people might be sad. That is not necessarily true or false. So once you get to mythology, you're dealing with connotation, with how it makes you feel, what you associate with things, not with the specific denotation, which is like what it literally means. So you go look up a dictionary, that's the denotation. The dictionary will tell you the denotation. If you want to understand a culture like popular culture studies, cultural studies, then you want to think more and more about the connotation. What does this mean? If I showed you a picture of this person or this person, what do you associate, right? So literally you could say, that's what this is or that's what this is, but on a denotative or a connotative level, sorry, on a connotative level, you would rely more on sort of feelings and on underlying assumptions that most people in society understand, right? Like. There are ideas that, I guess, in society, right? You see this, what are you supposed to think? Patriotism, uh, America, best country in the world, all these things, right? That's what you're supposed to. But yeah, you show that to a kid in, um, in a country that has been attacked by America, that has been bombed by America, maybe an Afghani kid who lost his parents, right? He might see that and think, horrible people, uh, military people, they don't care about individuals, especially outside of their country, right? That's not necessarily right or wrong, right? And it can sort of mean both. So it can be a, um, a symbol of freedom and a symbol of oppression because the mythology never comes out and says what it is. It's not a dictionary definition. This is important because every time you do anything, you're always giving two pieces of information minimum. You're giving the denotative position, like this is what I'm saying, and in the connotative position. Like, think about it. I always wear a jacket, and I always have books behind me. I never say that I'm smart, but I try to look smart and professional, and that's why I'm doing this, right? And so if it works, hopefully, you're thinking, well, that guy has a bunch of books. Those are written by this guy, so, you know, he wears a jacket at home when he's recording, and he doesn't have to. He must be smart or intellectual or something, right? And that's what I'm going for. If it works, great, you don't even think about it. You don't think about the secondary level. But now that I've pointed it out, now that you're thinking like, this guy doesn't seem as smart as he looks in terms of the way he's trying to present himself, there's something wrong here. And then the myth can kind of fall apart or the myth can be like, oh yeah, Chris, that guy who fakes trying to be smart and is always pictured in front of books and stuff, right? That could become a mythology and that's probably not the one that I want, but um, 
that's what happens when we deal with mythology, right? You don't say explicitly, you imply things. So if you were to show somebody a heroic picture of yourself, you'd be implying that you're a hero, even though you might not say, hey, I'm a hero, look at me. And you do this all the time, right? When I get an email from people that says, yo, Chris, check this out. If that's from a student that I've never met before, I'm gonna think a few things about that student, right? Not particularly professional. Who is this person? Um, I'm not clicking on a link by this person, right? But if you say something like, and I'm not saying you have to write it like this, but if you say like, dear Dr. Richardson, I was reading this and I thought it was really um, interesting in light of the conversation that we had the other day, especially relating to Roland Bard. I thought you would get a kick out of reading it. I've attached a PDF of this. You know, I'm probably more likely to click on that. And I'm just thinking now that if any spammers end up watching this, which I doubt, they might send me that and it'll be just a virus or something. So probably not going to click on that now. But anyway, that gives me the impression that this person is studious, that this person is considerate and, and that I know this person because they make reference and stuff. And that this is probably something I want to click on. Right. In both of these cases, the indication is, hey, here's something for you. Right. Click on this link. But in one, the mythology is much less proper and much less appealing to me than another mythology of, um, of somebody who seems very studious. And it may or may not be true, right? The first person may be smarter than the second person or may have better intentions than the second person, but the mythology, the secondary meaning matters. And that's why when you send emails, when you go to class and you, you know, sit up and you take notes versus you lay back and put headphones in, even if you're paying attention equally, there is a very different mythology about you as a student right? When you approach somebody and you act a certain way or you use certain language or you dress a certain way, regardless of how, how much we want this to happen in society, it does. There's a secondary meaning, right? You're always giving a secondary meaning. Now that you know that, you can be a little bit more conscious of the secondary meaning you give, right? So, for example, if you're quoting the readings that I give you every week and in in your responses, you're saying literally on a linguistic level, I read this and I'm quoting it, right? But on a secondary level, you're telling me I'm a student who pays attention. I'm a student who's willing to consider more deeply what's going on, right? As opposed to the opposite. If you're like, I don't know, and that's your response to a question, it tells me, yes, I don't know. But it also tells me like, you probably didn't try to read or you didn't try to explain it and you definitely didn't contact me or else I would know. And so that gives me a whole bunch extra information, right? You could say, Chris, I read this passage. I think he's trying to say this, but I'm not sure I understood it. Or you could send me a WTF. Both would indicate that you didn't quite get or that you're having trouble understanding something, but they say also very different mythological things, right? That's how we express so much. And we'll talk more about that throughout the term, really, because that's something we've on some level been talking about forever, right? The implied is often, especially in our culture, much more important and critical than the explicit. Because explicit, we all understand, hopefully. The implicit, a lot of people, it goes over their head. Like, uh, they think this thing is happening, but they don't know why. They can't put a, uh, their finger on it. They can't explain it. This just makes them happy. This makes them sad. Advertisers will take advantage of you if you don't understand this. Your peers will take advantage of you. Your surroundings, everyone in society... There's kind of the people who understand this secondary level, politicians definitely, their people understand it, and then there's people who don't understand it. And those are the people who are most vulnerable to falling for things. And when they do, and they're like, I thought this was this, the people always have an alibi because they can always say, we never said that explicitly. Most of the time you're communicating implicitly, not explicitly, especially if we're dealing with television, movies, comics, all these things. So it's crucial that you think about not just the denotation and the explicit, the linguistic basic level, but also the secondary lang language. The secondary language is myth. Um, it's connotation. It's the implied meaning and signification. So you have the signifier, signified is a sign, and then that sign becomes a signifier for the bigger thing, which is myth, which is more complicated, less uh, easily able to be pinned down, but much more powerful. And there's much more we could say, but I've taken up too much time already. I will try to be concise and articulate because that's the mythology I'm going for. Although now that I say it, it becomes explicit and then 
there's that whole other thing of making the implicit, explicit changes how you understand the world. And anyway, probably too much already. Watch this video one more time. Read the reading one more time. I promise you'll get it. And for the rest of your life, you will be happy that you understand this or you'll be taken advantage of. I don't want that. I'll see you next week. <laughs>